The signs that I'm really getting a migraine is that it's gone through this firewall of my tablets that most of the time work really well. Um, and I will be getting a pressure feeling here um, at the base of my skull, those two sort of bones at the base of your skull. It's always a pressure feeling. Migraine patients, at times, they would describe a vice tightening around their head or an ice pick getting into their skull from the outside to the inside. Do you know, I feel really emotional talking about it because I never talk, you know what I mean? I tell people now I have headaches, but when you suffer with it, you just live with it. And you, you, have, you know what it is for you, but most people never see you like that. Okay, Chris, I'm gonna ask you, how was your migraine on a level one to 10 yesterday when you had it? I woke up on the eight. Okay. Migraine, or migraine, is a condition which blights the lives of millions. Researchers are now beginning to understand just what goes awry in the brain in migraine. This film will look at the latest brain research and at current drug therapies, and will also ask if alternative treatments can help. Christine Perkins' business offers therapies to help her clients relax and feel happy. Normally she's healthy and relaxed herself, but then migraine strikes her too. They started probably in my early 20s, 22, 23. Um, they were completely incapacitating. I'd be out for a day or so, um, hiding under the covers. Any light, completely sensitive to it. Tunnel vision, mm -hmm. nausea. Um, I couldn't even keep down aspirin or anything that I had taken for them. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of typical. Right. And I was getting them probably once a week or so. Elizabeth Loder is the chief of the Division of Headache and Pain in a Department of Neurology in Boston. I think the public health burden of migraine is greatly under-recognized and underestimated, and, and in part that's because sufferers look well in between attacks. Uh, there's somewhat of a stigma attached to the disorder, so people don't talk about it. But in fact, if you interview people carefully, up to one in four women experiences migraine during the childbearing years, and the lifetime prevalence is about um, 18 to 19 percent in women and 9 to 10 in men. I think my migraine started a bit during my study of medicine, so I started my neurology residency in Germany. During this time, I had lots of stress, sleep deprivation, all the common migraine trigger factors. First time I was really exposed to them, and so this was really a big issue for me and made me interested in doing some research into this topic. A major part of our society thinks that migraine might be due to some psychological factors and there is no real mechanism underlying migraine. And our research is focused to improve this understanding that we see that there are real underlying genetical mechanisms that can be treated and improved. Mike Moskowitz heads Katerina's lab at the Harvard Medical School. Mike Moskowitz's work has really spanned the gamut from a basic explanation of what's going on in migraine, and I guess uh, I think it's fair to give him credit for putting the final nail in the coffin of the so-called old vascular theory. It's now very clear that migraine is a neurovascular disorder, and a lot of our understanding of migraine comes from Mike Moskowitz's basic work. I, I became interested in it because uh, of the discrepancy between the existence of pain on one side of the head and the prevailing views of migraine as due to substances within the circulation, which then caused me to look at what we knew about the anatomy of the innervation of blood vessels of the brain. And to my surprise, that had not actually been discovered. And so then we went about experiments at MIT to trace the fibers that innervate that provide the sensory innervation of blood vessels. And it turned out this was from the trigeminal ganglia, or the trigeminal nerve, the largest of the 12 cranial nerves and the one that's responsible for processing and producing pain in the head. Laying in the bed hurt my temples. Mm -hmm. Just the pressure of the pillow on my head mm -hmm. um, was excruciating. You're stuck in this cycle of pain. You can't sleep because of the pain. You can't take tablets because you're going to be sick, and you just live in this hell. There are many different forms of migraine. 
but the basic common phenomena for migraine is the presence of pain, either on one side of the head or on both sides of the head. My mother-in-law is an artist, and as an artist, she asks many questions and pay attention to details. She heard me on multiple occasions describe migraine. So if you notice in this painting, migraine is often unilateral. So on the right side of the face, the eye is closed. There is pain in the eye, like an arrow that is coming to the eye, which patients often describe that the pain is behind the eye, inside the eye, above the eye, but it involves the eye. There are stars that suppose to represent the aura, but I think that the striking part about it is the contrast between the left side of the face and the right side of the face to show the laterality of the headache, of the migraine. But what's it like to actually have a full-blown migraine? Caroline Harding has suffered from them since she was a teenager. Well, the visual disturbance um, is strange because I never get that with a headache, or if I get it, it's a very dull ache somewhere in the back of my head. Um, but it's always, it's like when you've looked at the sun and you see flashing light, so you blink and you think you'll blink and then you can see again, but you blink and it doesn't go. And then this light just gets bigger and bigger and bigger on the left-hand side until a whole of my left-hand vision I can't see, but I can still see at the right. It's always accompanied by tremendous pressure at the back of my head. Um, and I can feel fainty and dizzy. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, I'm, I have fainted. Um, but the pressure is almost the worst of the symptoms because you have the pain, but it's somehow completely combined with this pressure. Then I can start to feel sick and then I panic because I think the, the sick part is one of the worst parts. Once I start being sick, that's it then. And I'm sick dozens of times and I can't sip water or take painkillers. And that period, all I just say to myself is, this will pass. The particular aspects of migraine we're interested in are the events now that anticipate the onset of that pain because we believe that they're involved in the triggering of the pain. And it turns out that this event within the brain called cortical spreading depression is a noxious event. It's a spreading excitation of neuronal and glial waves, major cellular waves on the surface of the brain that appear to be able to produce an environment sufficient to trigger the nerve fibers that surround the blood vessels and the coverings of the brain proper. So the movie is trying to explain the mechanism for referred pain during migraine by first introducing the players in a system that, that involve migraine headache, which is the meninges in yellow, the pain fibers that run inside the head and send signal from the dur and the pia into the central nerve system, their cell bodies in the trigeminal ganglion, the central neurons in the spinal cord that goes to the thalamus, and the thalamic neurons that eventually goes to the cortex. We believe that during migraine there is a release of inflammatory molecules as a result of abnormal cortical activity like aura, and this release of inflammatory molecule will activate the pain fibers and send signals into the central neurons. So it is the peripheral red line that would explain why migraine throbs and why it gets worse when patients bend over, intracranial pressure increases and there is an ongoing activity along the intracranial pain fibers. I would say 30 years ago we focused on the anatomy and following the description of the anatomy, the question was, what about the chemistry and what about the neurotransmitters? And so that was the next phase of investigation. Then we began looking at the receptor populations that were expressed on these nerve cells that were projecting to the blood vessels. And we were very pleased to find the receptors for certain classes of drugs that are used to abort migraine attacks the ergot alkaloids, the triptan types of medication. There was a new GP at my practice and he said, try these, I believe they're more expensive. Um, they are this Zolmatriptan and they've just changed my life completely.
what these do is stop it totally so that within a couple of hours you feel completely okay again. So as long as the central neuron is firing because of incoming stimuli from the meningeal cells, tryptan in green, by blocking these signals, can quieten the neuron and arrest an attack in time before it gets out of control, even though the signals are still coming in. One thing we've always heard clinically from patients is that the timing of treatment makes a big difference. For years, I've had patients tell me about their medicines. It works if I catch the headache in time. And Rami went back to the lab and can give us a good explanation, you know, looking at how the neurons are activated and affected by the medications of exactly why it is that treating your headache early can render you pain free, whereas waiting a little bit longer means that the drug might help but still isn't going to completely get rid of the attack. If it's not stopped for a while, the central neuron become sensitized. When it gets sensitized, it starts firing on its own and it gets to the point that the activity of the central neuron become independent of the pain signals that come from the periphery at a point where drugs that act on the peripheral component no longer stop the ongoing activity in the central neuron, which explains why the drug that block the activation of the peripheral neuron is no longer capable of aborting the migraine headache. The medicines we have are much better than the medicines we had 20 or 30 years ago, but we're not quite there. Uh, you know, all of the drugs we have right now have unwanted side effects or don't work for some patients. And I think the real challenge that lies ahead is not only developing drugs that are much more targeted, but also trying to figure out and explain why drugs work for some patients and not others, you know, what's different. At one time in my life, I was going through a very turbulent period emotionally. Um, and my GP, who was extremely sympathetic, suggested that I take beta blockers, um, a very low dose, just to take the edge off the emotion. Um, and I took those for, I don't know, several weeks, maybe months. Um, and I remember thinking, this is so weird. I'm going through one of the worst periods of my life, but I'm not getting headaches. And then I started to feel a bit better and stopped taking the beta blockers and I got one of the worst migraines of my life. So I'm sure that taking those beta blockers were preventing them. I think the evidence that beta blockers are helpful as migraine preventives is quite solid. Um, Caroline is someone who clearly describes a benefit when she was on the beta blockers and that benefit disappeared almost as soon as she stopped taking the beta blockers. In fact, she describes a very bad uh, headache upon withdrawal of the beta blockers. That kind of withdrawal headache uh, isn't typical of uh, the experience that most patients have with beta blockers, but I think it, it does illustrate quite nicely um, how well the drug was working for her at that point. Devising the best medication for migraine is hard because individuals vary so much in their reactions and because the kind of migraine you have is related to just which parts of your brain's complex pain response systems are involved. Our laboratory is interested in understanding uh, changes that occur in the brain as a result of the disease we call migraine. We use a technology that's relatively new in the field to essentially be able to peer into the living human brain and uh, look at changes in function and structure and chemistry of patients who have migraine and healthy controls. And in this way, we're beginning to unravel a number of important changes in brain structure and function that really suggest that migraine is a disease of the central nervous system Normal brain imaging takes measures of brain structure. Functional magnetic resonance imaging looks at changes in blood flow and it captures images very fast and the changes are compared with baseline. And the difference represents functional changes in that area. One can measure a whole lot of neurotransmitters that may be important in migraine, particularly excitatory 
uh, neurotransmitters, which make neurons more excited and jump up and down, and neurotransmitters that actually may inhibit this process that we call inhibitory neurotransmitters. One of the common elements in the migraine state is hyper-excitable cortical areas. In the interictal state, that state that exists between migraine attacks and in the ictal state, uh, there is an increased activation in response to peripheral pain stimuli in an area that we call the temporal lobe. This information is new to the migraine field and would not have been possible without functional magnetic resonance imaging. In this slide, the green area represents the thalamus and the orange areas represent activation in this area in migraine patients compared with controls in response to a pain stimulus applied to their face. And the data is suggestive of a hyperexcitable state in this part of the thalamus that occurs with migraine patients and not in healthy controls. The brains of migraine patients may be different to those who don't have migraine. And thus, migraine represents a disease state and not just an intermittent painful event. No question that there are different locations in the brain that are responsible for the different symptomatology of migraine. For example, we know that when patients see the bright lights, flickering lights, that the occipital lobe is activated. When they have sensory symptoms, tingling and numbness in the corner of the mouth or in the hand, we know that it's the somatosensory cortex. When they become weak on one side of the body, we know that the motor cortex and the deep structures associated with that are affected. So migraine really can affect multiple structures within the brain, all of which have as a common feature the, uh, pr the occurrence of pain, uh, the triggering of pain um, as a final common pathway during the attack. Aura can be one of the most unsettling symptoms experienced by migraine sufferers. Aura is a focal neurologic event that usually precedes a headache, although not always. It can occur in isolation from a headache. It usually does not last longer than an hour. In fact, I'd say the duration in most patients is closer to half an hour. We know that only about 20 to 30 percent of people with migraine have aura, and many of them do not have it with every attack. Although we have a, a lot of good medications to treat migraine, patients are very interested in things they can do for their headaches that don't involve medication. I did get the neck and scalp massage and to release some of the tension that was up there, mm -hmm. and that was helpful. I have tried acupuncture a few times. Um, it worked much better for my sister than mm -hmm. it did for me and found that massage was probably my best thing. Mm -hmm. We don't have an strong enough evidence to make very dramatic recommendations about whether or not certain alternative treatments are helpful. That's definitely the spot that it really is affecting me the most. Mm -hmm. See all this tension here. But at the level of the individual patient, we take the attitude that whatever seems to work for that patient uh, is reasonable to do as long as it's not harmful. The one caution I would add is that those things do, for many patients, involve time and money. And so you can think of those as harms. And, and in making strong recommendations on a population level, uh, those things are important. If an individual patient decides that they're willing to spend the money or the time, I think that's fine. What do you think about preventive drugs? That seems to be a bigger frontier, but arguably more helpful for patients who have chronic forms of the disorder who can't take triptans as often as they have headaches. I don't think we're going to have a magic bullet mm -hmm. for all migraine patients. I think that it will be individualized medicine and tailored medications. For mm -hmm. a patient who has symptoms that suggest that the headache is coming, and the symptoms originate in the hypothalamus but not in the cortex, 
we may have a solution that differ from patients whose symptoms seem to originate in the brainstem mm. and seem to be different from patients whose symptoms originate in the cortex. So it's not going to be one size fits all. A large number of patients do tell you that they know a day yeah, before, a few right. hours before. We know today that from the time the aura begins until the headache begins, classically there are 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. If we shift our effort from prophylactic, which is a price because patients take right. all every day. And they're exposed to it even when they might not be prone to headaches and they have to live with the side effects all the time. We may be more specific, mm -hmm. intercept the pathway, a, co a final common pathway, and be better for the patients because we are not going to treat them all months long with a drug that mm -hmm. affects other brain functions. Okay, that's good. You can open your eyes and you can put your hands down. Um, does anyone in your family have headache problems? Okay. My sister and my mother both have migraines as well. I see. It's very clear and has been for a long time that migraine has genetic components. And we certainly clinically hear from people who have migraine that many people in their family are affected. There are rare types of migraine with aura, familial hemiplegic migraine, uh, where there's a very clear genetic component and some of the genes responsible for that condition have been identified. And then, of course, a very exciting recent thing is that a genome-wide association study has identified an area on chromosome 8 that may be involved in more common forms of migraine. We think there are um, different genetic factors that increase the risk of migraine that interact with environmental factors and with all different factors we don't know about. So there is a genetically determined susceptibility to migraine, which only produces migraine if there are other environmental factors coming together with the genetic factors. Although both Caroline and Christine have benefited from currently available treatments, they still are greatly affected in their everyday lives by the headaches that they have. And um, Christine, I think it was, that described to me how she never goes anywhere without her medication. She's always thinking about the possibility that she'll have an attack. So I would hold out the hope that current research might identify ways that we could intervene earlier in a patient's headache course to prevent progression to such frequent headaches, and beyond that, perhaps identify more reliable ways of preempting attacks so that patients can have more confidence in their medication or non-medication interventions. With the multimodal imaging approaches, we can look into the human brain in migraine state in ways that were never before possible and begin to uh, answer questions and perhaps even pose new questions in a way that we can then look at how therapies may change these processes in a beneficial way.